If you are struggling with shortness of breath this morning, will you just put your hand up? We want to pray for you. Okay. Let's pray for these that have responded. <coughs> Thank you, Father. You sent your word and it doesn't return to your void. And I believe that's the word that you've sent. And so we pray. Breathe your breath into each one of these who've put their hands up. In Jesus' name. And we rebuke that which is seeking to rob you of breath. In Jesus' name. And we say, breathe with an overflow in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you pray especially for Barbara Bromley? She's got this uh, fibrosis, <coughs> really struggling with her breathing. You could just pray for, mm. for Barbara. And we pray for Barbara, Lord, and we just agree together. Lord, will you bring a healing to her breathing now in Jesus' name? Where she is, may she just feel your touch and your breath. The breath of the Holy Spirit Thank you. flooding her lungs in Amen. Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And Father, continue to speak to our hearts, we pray, through your word this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay. Can I just move this over here? Okay, well, exciting title for this morning. My giving. Just the message you want to hear, eh? It's an act of our worship. It's an act of our worship. Okay. My giving. God's heart of love finds its, its expression in giving. Yeah? Yeah. God so loved the world that he gave. And he gave sacrificially so that we could enjoy the benefits of his life. He gave Jesus. But Jesus first gave himself... Then he gave to us. Okay? His love in us finds a similar expression. If you are born of the Spirit, if you've accepted Jesus into your heart, the Spirit of God has come in, and that heart is in you. Forgiving. God doesn't primarily want our resources. Before you have a heart attack, Steve, just hold on. I know. I have no problems. Okay. It's the trustees you have to worry about. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. George is look, looking a bit pale on the back there. But God doesn't primarily want your resources. He wants you. That's right. Then he wants giving from a heart that surrendered to him. And if you want a reference for that, 2 Corinthians 8, the Macedonian church. God doesn't need our resources. There's no shortage in heaven. Yeah? Praise God. God doesn't need our resources, but he uses giving to grow his heart in you. And to build a foundation... In your heart for heavenly riches. I'm going to look at that. He wants to build a foundation in your heart to, so he can flood you with heavenly riches. Okay? Um, handling your wealth is important to God, or how you handle your wealth is important to God. There's about 38 parables, and 12 of them are about how you handle wealth. 
So that's nearly a third of the parables about how you handle wealth. Aren't you glad you only get it once a year? <laughs> but God sees it as important. It's very important, actually, because it's the key to the anointing of God on your life. I'm going to look at that in a minute. I want to read a scripture from Luke 16. Now, we did a trial run on this in the men's group because uh, I wanted to get revelation from them so I could include it in my message and show you how good I am at getting revelation. But if there's any heresy in this, <laughs> it's not me. Sorry. <laughs> but hopefully there won't be any heresy in this message. <laughs> Luke 16. I, I can't read it on there. I'm going to read it from here. Jesus told his disciples, there was a rich man whose steward was accused of wasting his goods. So he called him and he said to him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your stewardship, for you no longer can be steward. The steward said to himself, what do I do now? My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do so that when I lose my stewardship, people welcome me into the, their houses. So he called in one of his master's debtors and he asked him first, how much do you owe my master? 900 gallons of oil, he replied. The steward told him, take your bill, sit down quickly and write 450. Then he said to another, how much do you owe? He said, 100 measures of wheat. He said to him, take your bill and write 80. And the master commended the unjust steward because he'd done wisely. Hmm. For the sons of this world are in their generation wiser than the sons of light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it is gone or fails, you will be welcomed into an eternal home. He who is faithful in little is faithful in much, and he who is unjust in little is unjust in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you? with true riches. And that last verse there, if you've not been faithful in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? Those true riches are the heavenly riches. It speaks of God's anointing and God's presence and God's glory and God's power on your life, God's nature in your life. <coughs> and that's what we want, yeah? Yeah. The, found, the training ground... To experience that is how you handle worldly wealth. One of the first things that God started to deal with me as a Christian was wealth and my resources and my finances and how I handled them and how I saw them. And it's the training ground. So this, this message is important, really, um, for us to get a grasp of. Isn't this an interesting parable, do you think? Yeah. Some commentators question whether this parable should be, should be in the Bible. Because it seems like God is commending dishonesty. We'll take a look at it, see if he is. I don't think he is. No, he's not. Some commentators, if you look on the commentaries on this, you won't get a lot out of them. Because they just want to bypass it. But as I've chewed on this, I felt the Lord was focusing me on this. And I, as I've been chewing on it, I have found there's a very profound message in it for us. Okay? So let's, let's unpack it a little. Um, okay. First thing I want you to note is that from this passage, we're not owners of our resources, we're stewards. And that's what we need to see. All that you have is not yours, it's God's. The earth and the fullness of the earth belongs to God. God. So what you have, God has entrusted to us to handle the way he wants us to handle it. And we have to see it that way. So important. A year into being a Christian, I, I heard a message on giving and I thought, oh, I need to probably surrender my finances to God. 
So I did, and I, I, I felt very holy when I did it. I said, Lord, you can have the whole lot. Amen. Two weeks later, I'm going downtown to buy a pair of trousers because I needed a new pair of trousers. Halfway down, I felt the Lord check me and say, are you going to spend my money? <laughs> and I, I didn't want to hear that. At the end of the day, I had to come home and I couldn't bear, buy a pair of trousers. I felt so guilty because I, I had asked God whether I should do it. I was using his resources according to the way I wanted to use them. Two weeks later, I got a brand new pair of trousers <laughs> for nothing. Yay. Isn't God good? Yeah. That's the difference between living in the world economy or heaven's economy. And from that point, God was starting to teach me how to handle finances. And I thought, it's a lot more exciting when you do it God's way than handling it the world's way. A lot more exciting. I haven't had a wage for 40 odd years. And it's so exciting to see how God just pours in an abundance. Amen. An abundance. Never lacked. Praise God. Um, we need to engage Heaven's economy, so important. Secondly, this, this teaches us also, we're going to give account to God for everything that we have and how you've used it. You're going to give an account for everything you've handled. <coughs> and that is going to decide your future. Hmm. There's a challenge. This steward has mishandled his master's... In fact, it says he's wasted his goods. What's the definition of wasted, do you think, there? Well, I'm going to suggest to you this. W wasting the master's goods is seeing his goods as yours and not his. That's what wasting the master's goods is. Seeing the goods or the resources you have or the wealth you have as yours and not his. And when you use it under your control, it's wasted and it doesn't enrich the kingdom. It's just wasted. Hmm. And we need to use what we have to enrich the kingdom so we en enrich our eternal state. And that's why. Okay? Some people believe they should give a tenth, a tithe of their gross income. And what they say is, we give a tenth to God because that's God's and the 90% is ours. <laughs> I'm going to suggest to you that 90% is wasted for the kingdom. It's all God's. It's all God's. Now, 10% is specific that we give to a specific work, but it's all God's. And in the light of that, we could all fall into the category of unjust stewards, Yeah. Easily, because if we've handled our wealth without God, then we become an unjust steward, just like this guy here. Okay? Well, not exactly like this guy here, but close. Um, as a result, this guy opens the door to accusation in his life, to exposure, to despair, to shame, and a hard time ahead. And he forfeits his stewardship because of it. I don't want to even teach on forfeiting your stewardship at this point. But I don't want to be there. <laughs> okay. Um, have you heard hard times ahead? Well, there's hard times ahead for this guy. And the, the, the government's telling us there's hard times ahead for the world's economy. But there's an alternative way to live. That's engaging heaven's economy, and that's what we're going to look at today to some degree. Okay? <laughs> Listen to what Philippians 4.19 says. My God shall supply. You can take that off, by the way, now, John. That slide, don't need it at the moment. Um, Philippians 4.19 says, My God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Notice it doesn't say God shall supply all your need according to the riches in the Bank of England. <laughs> it says according to the riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. That's heaven's economy. 
When I first went into ministry and I was desperate for, for something that I had need of, uh, an envelope dropped through the door as I was praying and, and it just had the money, the right amount of money in it for me to go and buy what I needed to buy and on it was, he is able to supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus and I've never forgotten that scripture. It started my walk of faith in that area. Hallelujah. And that's what we can tap into, church, not the world's economy. You don't have to live with hard times ahead. Hallelujah. Mm. Fourthly, the steward's apparent wheel of dealing is commended by the master for his wisdom. Now that's the challenge here. How on earth can God commend his continued dishonesty? It would appear he's been continually dishonest. He's not only been challenged for misusing his master's goods, which we're going to assume is a picture of a type of God and us, okay? But it appears he's gone off and dropped the bill for these people that he's talked, or two of them anyway, that's mentioned here, which seems to be dishonest. Would you agree? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So why is Jesus, or why is God <laughs> commending this wisdom? Let's take a look at, a little deeper at the wisdom of uh, what's being commended here. In verse 8, and you don't need to bring it back up, John, but it's okay. In verse 8, the mas master says he commends the unjust steward. Now I want to look at the word unjust because there's a key in the word unjust. Um, in the Woos translation of the Bible, which gives us a bit more depth from the Greek, <coughs> excuse me, and Thea as well, the Greek there. The word unjust means to violate both the law and justice. Now that's interesting. To violate both the law and injustice. Now, he was unjust towards his master, but he's violated the law. Now, what was the law that he'd violated? Hmm? Thou shalt not steal. Bear with me. <laughs> I was reading the Amplified on this, an Amplified classic version, if you've got it. And it suggests, there's a little note there, that the law that had been broken was the law of unlawful interest. It was unlawful to charge a fellow brother Jew interest. And if you did, well, you were unlawful. So what, they would, what some of the Jews would do was not call it interest, call it principle. And just say, well, they double the amount. They got round the loophole, as it were, in the letter of the law, but violated the spirit of the law. It was a common practice in those days for the Jewish tax collectors, for the Romans, to collect the taxes that the Romans needed, but also add their cut on top. Yeah? Common practice. I'm going to suggest to you that that's what he did here. And I'm going to try and give you a bit of evidence of why I believe that. And it's important to recognize, I think. I'm going to suggest to you that he increased his pr the price of these bells by his own cut. And when he came to reduce them, he reduced his cut and removed his cut. Okay? It's a possibility, yeah? You don't look too convinced here. What's this guy teaching? If it gets into heresy, it's the men's group. What's the evidence? I'm going to suggest to you the master's response is an interesting response. The master is commending him for his wisdom. If you had just been ripped off by somebody and you brought them to account and said, you're about to lose your job and I'm going to have a word with you on Monday... And you went out and dropped his, uh, uh, his, the debts to him even more, and he was getting more ripped off. How do you think he's going to feel? Ready to co commend him or a bit more angry? But he isn't more angry. He's commending him. So I'm going to suggest to you that not only has he reduced his amount, 
So he's not charging illegal interest now, but the master is also getting his debts paid as well, and he's happy with that. Yeah? Yeah. Hmm. Because then, if you read that into this, it makes an awful lot of sense as we go on. Okay? So he stopped illegal interest and he secured his master's, pay his master's payments. So he's not commending past or continued dishonesty. What he's commending is the wisdom that has done this. That he sacrificed of his own in the present to secure his future. That's the key to this passage. And that's what this passage is te teaching. Take your present resources and invest them in the future, to secure a good future. And it's not just in this generation future, but it's an eternal home he's talking about. So what, how you handle your resources today is going to secure something of an enrichment in your reward in heaven into eternity. And that's how we should view our resources. They're God's, and we're going to invest them in his kingdom for the future. the main theme. Now, it doesn't mean to say you can buy a place in heaven. You can't buy a place in heaven. But you can secure an enriched place in heaven. Jesus, or the master here, gives, well, Jesus actually, Jesus goes on to say, um, he gives an example of the worldly sons. He says the sons of this world in their generation, so it's not in it to eternity, it's just the time they're living. But worldly sons are wiser than the sons of light. What does that mean? Have you noticed that many people in the world work hard to secure a future for their kids? Secure a future to get a house. Secure a future to become mortgage free. Secure a few, uh, secure, uh, work hard to secure great holidays, to retire early, and so you can go on. And he's saying, look at how the world lives. Look at how they are working hard to secure a good future only in this generation. And he's saying, I want you to translate it to the eternal generation. You work hard with the resources today to secure an eternal home. And what happens when you come into that home, all right? And he's using the example of the world. So, verse 9 says how to use the present resources. How do we do it? Let's bring up that slide, John, if you would. Verse 9 again. Use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it's gone or fails, when does it go or fail? Sorry? Before you die. Well, it, it, it does. It, well, it can do, but it, I think it's referring to when you die here. How many know your resources can't go with you? <laughs> but you could have sent them ahead. But that's what it's telling us to do here. But when it fails, they will welcome you into an eternal home. What does that mean? What does that mean? Welcome you into eternal home. 1 Thessalonians, Les Thessalonians 2.19 says this. Paul had planted this church, and there's a similar verse in Philippians, so he, which he, that was the church he also planted. And it says this. For what is our hope or our joy or our crown of glory are not even you before our Lord Jesus at his coming? People were his crown. And the people he had invested in were his crown. The people he'd invested in with kingdom things and touched and enriched people's lives with the kingdom, they are going to be his crown in heaven. When he gets there, there'll be a whole load of people saying, thank you, Paul, for investing in our lives. They're going to welcome you into an eternal home. Isn't that nice? And it's part of your crown, part of your eternal crown, your reward and your eternal state is linked to the people you've enriched with kingdom things now. Friends, make friends, welcome, uh, you know, friends welcome you into the heaven thanking you for your investment. I'm going to give you a couple of examples. 
long time back in Alpha, there was two couples came on Alpha. And I, I don't, they didn't know the Lord. And we sat there having the meal in the evening. And I'm sat next to one couple. And the lady said to me, who's paying for this food? I said, oh, well, the, the church. But actually, the people who are making it usually pay for it because they don't claim the expenses of them. So that she said, the church is giving a free meal here. I said, yeah. I can't believe that. She was blown away by the investment of this church in a meal. And actually, those two couples at the end of Alpha gave their lives to the Lord. Praise God. They were so blown. And that was the thing that seemed to blow them away more than anything else. They were giving them a free meal. And the people in this church were giving them a free meal. Amazing, isn't it? Amazing. One of those couples is still in this church. Another couple went on to be in another church. But praise God. I was in ministry um, and traveling around the country and my car was becoming very unreliable. And one day I was down in uh, Wiltshire staying with a couple and I said, I'm going to look to buy a, a, another car. It wasn't a brand new one, but a, a more reliable one. I and the lady said, well, I, I need a new car, so can I come with you? It's fine. So off we went to Newbury, it was somewhere. Um, to Volkswagen there and I was looking at a Golf and I thought oh that's I just knew the Lord was saying that's the one I thought okay how much is it so gave me a price how much should we give me for my old car and, and I was a thousand short and I said can you do anything he said no that's it that's the way it is so I thought oh I must have missed it got it wrong so I walked away and then the other lady was looking at another car at the time she said aren't you getting that one then I said I'm a thousand short she says oh don't worry about that you've got it I'll give you the thousand, go and get it. Oh, I thought, oh, bless her. And it was a blessing. About a month later, I was traveling around and the Lord was moving in the meetings and people were getting saved and healed and set free and God was doing amazing things. It was exciting. And I felt the Lord say to me, you go and tell Monica what she's just done. And I had to go and tell her, I said, Monica, what you've done by giving me a thousand pounds for my, for my car Everywhere I go in that car in ministry and everybody I touch in that, they are part of your reward as well. Amen. Yeah. She was blown away by that as well. I was as well. I thought, wow. Um, and all those people that I touch for the kingdom through the Holy Spirit, they're all going to be standing there where Monica goes into heaven. They're going to say, well done, Monica. Come into the home. Isn't that wonderful? That's how we invest in the kingdom. You know, when you give stuff away to people, they can't handle it. I've had many people say, what's wrong with it? <laughs> Nothing's wrong with it. I just want to give it to you. Are you sure? It opens. We have seen so many people come to the Lord as a result of that. Not just come to the Lord, but hearts melt towards you and enriched in the kingdom. And that's how he's saying we should use our resources. What constitutes a good steward? Freely you have received from God all that you have. Freely give. It's going to be exciting next week, yes? <laughs> freely give. Where do we give? When do we give? What do we give? It's not your call. Because you're a steward. So it's not your call. It's just saying, Father, where do I give? What do I give? Who do I give? To. Two. If you're building the kingdom, it means you're listening to the king. And with hard times looming ahead, there's a great promise I love to preach on this session. Can we have the next slide, please, John? 2 Corinthians 9, 7 to 8. God loves a cheerful giver. The word in the Greek there means hilarious. <laughs> yeah. And actually, if you can't give hilariously, don't give. God doesn't want what you give begrudgingly. That's true. Don't give it. Yeah. He'd rather you be cold than lukewarm. Mm. Yeah. And there's many scriptures I could give you on that one. And God, this is it, and God is able to make all grace, every, this is the Amplified, all grace, every favour and earthly blessing come to you in abundance so that you may always and under all circumstances and whatever the need, be self-sufficient in all things, possessing enough to require no aid or support or 
be furnished uh, and be furnished in abundance for every good work. Hallelujah. Yeah. Chew on that for a few hours. <coughs> when your energy bills come in. There's enough power in heaven to draw from. Amen. I want to tell you, if you even haven't got it in your bank, we have seen money fall out of heaven. Just supernaturally. It doesn't always come that way. Rarely comes that way, but we've seen it happen when needed. So you're thinking, well, who's going to help me out? God is there to help you out. Hey, the, the a whole nation went 40 years through a wilderness believing God's resources from heaven. It's not just a nice doctrine. It can be our experience. And I think God has given us these times to trust in him and to prove him and be able to be an overflow to others. That's going to open hearts. We're here to build the kingdom, not your kingdom. What a scripture. That's heaven's economy. I want to be in heaven's economy, don't you? Make sure you give it willingly and listen to this. He'll furnish every good work. He ain't going to furnish a dead work. What you think you want to do for God ain't going to get furnished. But what you hear God say, furnish that, then he'll pour in as you pour out in obedience to him. Do every, hey, we can't be involved in any other work than a good work, which is a God work. And if you're involved in a God work, that verse is going to kick in every time. Oh, and I've only got to the introduction. I'm excited. Oh, praise the Lord. What a father we have. What a good father we have. How, how can I be a good steward? Tithing. One of the ways we can do it is to tithe. I, <laughs> I heard the other day a well-known international Bible teacher stand up and say, tithing is not scriptural in the New Testament. I thought, ooh, I like a challenge like that, don't you? I thought, well, that's an interesting way of looking at it. Okay, he says it's the Old Testament law. And he was right, it's in the Old Testament law. But where did tithing first kick in? Before the law. Yes! First person to tithe, give a tenth of his gross income, was Abraham. Yep. He just had a miraculous battle that he won with God's help. I uh, won't go into all the detail, but on his way back with the spoils, he met Melchizedek, who was Jesus. Okay, if you do a study in that, you'll see it was Jesus. And what, he had communion with him, and then he gave him a tithe and declared, the God of heaven is my only source. All right? And that was pre-law, but still in the Old Testament. But Paul, Romans 4.12 Brought it into the New Testament. Walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham. What, what was one of those steps? He tithed. And he, he declared, I'm going to make God my sole resource. Now, he had to work that through a little. But he got there, eventually. I'm going to suggest to you that teacher had got it wrong. God has brought tithing into the New Testament. And he even mentions it. And I just want to highlight what Abraham did just for a moment. Abraham, in giving his tenth and declaring God was his sole resource, the land was in famine when he went into it. And part way through, it says, the land came into fullness of bread. Oh, church, hear this. A land of scarcity, a land of hardship ahead, a land of a lack can be turned into a land of fullness of bread and the land of the fullness of God's blessing. 
because we decide I want to make my resources God's and make him my only resource to me and I'm going to give him a tenth and start there and then offerings and whatever else because it's all his anyway. We can turn this nation from a land of hardship and scarcity into a land of the fullness of God's blessing. And Abraham did it. And he says, walk in it. Hmm. What a hope we have. Makes you want to get your checkbook out, doesn't it? Or well, your phone. Sorry? Or your phone these days. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Whatever. I just want to accommodate those who don't believe in tithing. That's fine. But I just want you to take a look at Matthew 5. Jesus compares law, the Old Testament, and grace. Now, there was a lot of grace in the Old Testament, but they call it that. So let's compare law and grace for a moment. Jesus said, the Old Testament says, don't murder. The New Testament says, don't get angry. The law, don't commit adultery. The New Testament says, don't even lust at the opposite sex. The Old Testament says, hate your enemy. The New Testament says, love your enemy. Which is a higher standard, do you think? <laughs> Grace. Grace. God's spirit in you, giving all you the resources to live that lifestyle. It says, a higher standard. He's up the ante, as it were. So let's take a look at law, tithing. What do you think the New Testament is going to say? It's going to increase it, do you think? Plus, maybe, to the whole lot. Tithing's looking pretty good now, isn't it? So you live by either one. Jesus is going to fulfill the Old Testament, which is at least a tithe. Let's invest our resources in kingdom work. Let's touch people's lives for the kingdom. That's what it's about. That's right. Whether to bring them into salvation or whether to enrich them as believers. I'm going to suggest, where do we do it? Well, that's God's call, as I've already said. But let me just say this in, in conclusion. New Life Church is committed... And this is the one thing that impresses me about this church. It did when I first came here, and it still impresses me today. I don't know whether you agree with me, but this New Testament, uh, New, New Life Church is committed to reaching and helping people for the kingdom. Would you agree with that? Yes. I'm amazed at this church and how it reaches out into its community, to touch its community. So it's a place where you can invest. And if you're a taxpayer, you can gift aid it because it's charitable status. And Liz Trust has told us that what's ahead is growth, growth, and growth. <laughs> so why don't you get Liz Trust to grow the kingdom here in Congleton? Amen. <clears throat> By gift aiding it. Yeah. Well, let's grow the kingdom and let's change the UK to fullness, not scarcity. We can start it next Sunday. Be faithful with your resources. They're not yours, they're his. So that you can grow in spiritual riches. That's what we really want. Amen? Amen. Lord bless you.